When we hear the term damage control, we think of damaged hulls and fighting fires and flooding, but that's only part of the picture. Damage control measures taken before a ship goes into action are equally important. Part of any warship's damage control efforts is its library of plans and manuals that describe how to configure systems prior to battle and how to respond to every conceivable problem. We're particularly lucky to have access to the Engineering Casualty Control Book written by Commander K.E. Bond, who served as engineering officer on Texas during World War II. This was the Bible that described how to prepare the ship's steam system and equipment for battle and how to manage single and multiple failures. I want to thank Travis Davis of Battleship Texas Foundation for helping identify Commander Bond's dates of service on the ship. While flooding and fires must be quickly and effectively dealt with, there is one thing that takes priority over all others, the steam system and its boilers. Without steam, the ship loses practically all of its pumps and pressure on the fire mains. Without steam for the electrical generators, there will be no portable pumps and little effective lighting. We don't have the drawings and illustrations that accompany Commander Bond's book, but its descriptions contain more than enough detail to understand how to configure the ship's systems before going into combat and how to offset any damage to keep steam pressure up in the ship above water and in the fight. Here's a simplified diagram for the steam system that includes three subsystems. The blue indicates the 300-pound steam system that directly powered the ship's engines and dynamos that produced electrical power. The red shows a small portion of the complex auxiliary steam system that powered practically all other devices, including pumps and the steam steering and anchor windlass engines. Finally, we have the green that shows the feed water system that provided water to the boilers. Our focus will be on the 300-pound system for the moment since it fed everything, including the auxiliary system. Maintaining steam pressure is all about absorbing damage and minimizing its effects when it occurs. Here are the boilers and the major loads fed by the system that includes the two main engines, two forward dynamos, and two aft dynamos. Let's see how the system is built up to accomplish that. Two large 14-inch steam mains extend along both sides of the boiler rooms and back to the engine rooms. Two feed lines connect each boiler to the main adjacent to it, and cross-connecting lines tie the two mains together in each boiler room and also the engine rooms. This creates what's called a ring main that will provide high volume, balanced steam and power to all equipment. We need to add stop valves throughout the system that can isolate boilers, boiler rooms and entire sections of the system. And lastly, let's pipe into the engines and dynamos, then take a look at how the system was configured for battle and possible damage. To configure for combat, or what was called condition 1, Stop valves in the boiler and engine room's cross-connecting lines are closed to split the steam system in half. The result is the port side boilers in each room feed only the port engine and the starboard boilers feed only the starboard engine. The electrical system is also split so that the forward dynamos are fed from the starboard main and the aft dynamos are fed by the port main. The reason for this should be obvious. If there was catastrophic damage to either main, the ship would still have half of its electrical power and one of its engines running without interruption. Without a split system, you could potentially lose everything and have a dead ship. Let's see what happens with four different system failures. Say there's a tube failure or firebrick collapse resulting in the loss of a boiler. Three stop valves and the cross connect valve are immediately closed to isolate the boiler from the system. Also notice that other cross connects have been opened to reunify the system and provide balanced steam to both engines. Loss of the boiler is made up by changing to larger burner tips and boosting forced draft air to increase boiler output. However, overfiring them can damage boilers, so it's only a temporary solution. What if 412 degree steam from a major pipe rupture inside a boiler room makes it uninhabitable? As the crew evacuates the room, stop valves are closed to isolate both boilers. Fuel pumps and boiler fuel feed are shut off with remote quick-acting valves, and relief valves are opened to release boiler pressure through the smokestack. Force draft blowers push fresh air into the room, and heat and steam are pushed out through the boilers and up the stack. Once cleared, crew can re-enter the room to make repairs. Let's now say the starboard 14-inch steam main ruptures. It's immediately isolated by closing two stop valves and the starboard engine can continue to run off of the port main by opening the 11 inch cross connect line running between the two engine rooms. The fourth scenario has a really creative solution. 
In this case, a ruptured main in an engine room has disabled the engine, but not for long. You can see that the left and right mains remain separated, and both the stop valve and the main throttle valve have been closed to isolate the leak. Once that's been done, the 150-pound auxiliary steam system will be used to run the engine. Auxiliary devices receive their steam by tapping into the 300-pound cross connects in the boiler rooms. Engine room auxiliaries receive steam through a line from boiler room 4. Some is also received by tapping off steam from the receivers that connect the high and intermediate cylinders on the engines. By backfeeding into the engine's auxiliary line, 150-pound steam will bypass the main steam line, throttle valve, and high-pressure cylinder to power the engine's intermediate and low-pressure cylinders at reduced power. Let's move on to fresh water. The boilers require huge amounts of it to make steam. The basic feed water system starts back at the engine rooms where large condensers convert waste steam back into water. From there, air pumps, which are actually vacuum pumps, provide suction that removes dissolved air from the water, improves performance on the engine's low pressure cylinders, and pushes water into the hot well, which is also called the feed water reserve tank. Feed water is then pumped at a pressure of 400 psi back into the boilers. While this is a closed loop system, there are always losses that must be made up for using makeup water tanks located beneath the boilers. A likely problem with water doesn't come from battle damage, but from leaks inside the condenser that can poison fresh water with salt. Since feed water was continuously checked for salt, it would be immediately spotted and the offending condenser would be taken offline with a check valve. Crossover valves would be opened so that all boilers fed off of the other condenser and feed line. In the unlikely chance that both condensers fail or pumps in both engine rooms, auxiliary feed pumps in each boiler room can be used to suck water from the feed tanks, makeup tanks beneath the boilers, and emergency tanks. However, repairs must be quickly made since without condensers it's no longer a closed system and the boilers will use all available water in only 14 hours if cruising at 10 knots or in as little as 2.5 hours at full steam. The third concern is fuel. This was addressed in a previous video but we're going to do it again more thoroughly to discuss damage control measures. As you can see, the fuel system was incredibly complicated with 92 fuel tanks and a network of pipes and valves. This required great attention during normal steaming in peacetime and impossible to manage when in battle. For that reason, the entire fuel system was closed off except for six battle tanks that had their own dedicated feed lines into the boiler rooms. These contained enough fuel to keep the boilers running for a full day at a 10 knot cruising speed or six hours at 20 knots. A cross section also shows that they were the most protected tanks on the ship with three layers of protection outboard of them and a double bottom filled with water beneath them. If continuous testing indicated that one of the tanks showed water in the fuel that could disable a boiler, it was immediately closed and crossover lines provided fuel from the other tanks on that side. If extended operations resulted in any of the six tanks getting low, it could be replenished from surrounding tanks by opening check valves serving one of them and pumping its fuel through recirculating lines not being used into the almost empty battle tank. Let's now say there is a torpedo hit on the starboard side that takes out many of the fuel tanks including the battle tanks. Because of damage to the pipes and valves, the entire system on that side of the ship has been disabled. Due to the system's complexity, we haven't shown how fuel is handled inside the boiler rooms up until now. This drawing is actually a very simplified version since it does not include scores of pipes and valves that provide redundancy. The red lines and symbols show the fuel feed system that comes from the tanks and feeds into the heated service tanks. The green shows a second system that transfers oil from the service tanks to the boilers. Fuel is pulled from the tanks with booster pumps through heaters that partially heat it before going to the service tanks. If there's a loss of pressure or water in the oil, check valves are immediately closed on the starboard side and fuel continues to flow uninterrupted from the port tanks and pipes. Let's now look at the portion of the fuel system that directly serves the boilers. When we do that, it becomes apparent that the service tanks actually serve two purposes. They store fuel that is kept hot so that it will smoothly flow through the service pumps, a final heater stage, and to the boilers. More importantly for damage control, they also serve as buffers that can provide fuel without being replenished long enough to change tanks or solve most fuel quality or feed problems. 
So as you can see, engineering and the damage control team had a well-developed game plan that short of a massive hit that destroyed all three boiler rooms, would always provide steam to keep the ship alive and fighting. 